the day. Gosh, I, I am really impressed. There's so many people here. And I know this is a really tough topic. I don't know, maybe you're not really here for me, but you're more here for Kim. <laughs> but um, anyway, well, um, it's going to be a little bit heavy, but um, it's such a nice day. I really give you credit for you know, being proactive and wanting to be interested in this topic. So um, I'm going to talk about end of life um, decisions and also just kind of end-of-life considerations after care, that's going to be at the very end, but mostly about kind of, you know, what to expect at end-of-life for pets and, and maybe a little bit about how you make that decision. Um, you know, there's no great scaffold for me to tell you this is, you know, what you fall over making that decision because every situation is different, every family is different, every disease process is different, and so you know, no one can say, in this situation, you would do this because every person is going to make a different decision. Um, but we'll try at least to go over some resources that can help you with that and maybe how to start to think about things and put it into perspective. Um, I really like this saying, and all the pictures that you'll see are patients that we have helped. Um, and you'll see them on our website. Uh, if you go there to, uh, I thought this is a really nice picture of this little kitty. I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, um, not because I want to um, make it about me at all, but I do want to give you some idea about my background. Um, so I graduated in 1999 from Oregon State University and Washington State University at the cooperative program at that time. They don't anymore. And um, I went into practice in a very high volume, um, low cost clinic at the time in West Lynn and it was kind of trial by fire, um, but it also was very, very hard too, um, but I, I did learn a lot, and it also kind of burnt me out pretty quickly, and so I um, decided to do some other things. I found myself eventually um, doing some research on uh, initially drug-eluting intracoronary stents, and then eventually I migrated into doing some research on hum human clinical trials on pacemakers and defibrillators for a company here in Lake Oswego. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I enjoyed that, but I found that I was kind of moving away from veterinary medicine. And um, I had always been thinking about doing a home euthanasia practice because when I had been in, in practice, we would have those requests every once in a while. I didn't really know who was doing that. We had like a, one name that we referred to and I didn't know what happened afterwards and never got any sort of feedback. And I thought, you know, I, I think that this is probably something that's needed. But I really didn't have any idea how much um, it would be needed. So we started the service in 2009. Um, we're going to be hitting our five-year anniversary in March. And we've helped thousands of patients um, since we started. Um, I can honestly say it's been probably the, the most rewarding thing that I've done in veterinary medicine. I mean, people ask me all the time, how do you do this? And you must have, you just have the hardest job. And I don't know how you could do it. But believe it or not, it is, it is very rewarding. And it's hard to describe why that is, um, other than I really do feel like I'm, I'm helping at a very important time. And people are very emotional and they need support. They need support, um, you know, in a, in a very experienced manner, too knowing how to help them, knowing how the process and the procedure should go and how they're a little bit different than in the clinic even. Uh, we are in 24-7 and we go to Oregon. We go up to Washington, we are in Oregon as well. We go all over down to Salem, we've gone out to the coast, we go up to the mountain not infrequently. We go up to Woodland, Washington, La Centra. Um, and we have seven veterinarians right now, including myself, and then I have a practice manager who's a veterinarian as well and two certified veterinary technicians as well. And they mostly do phone support for us because um, actually a lot of the time that we spend is on the phone with people and helping them make, make the decision. Um, and, and sometimes they've really made the decision, but you know they just need some extra support. Um, we do small animals mostly. We do a few exotics and, as you can see, an occasional really exotic for us, a pig and a goat. Um, and we also provide cremation and aftercare, cremation support, I should say. So we usually work with dignified pet services, um, but we do have um, relationships with other crem crematories in the area because sometimes people we'll have a specific one in mind. And we provide transport to the, cre to the crematory as well, which really helps people because they oftentimes don't want to do that for themselves. They don't really want to deal with the body afterwards, although sometimes they do. Um, 
So our mission is to dedicate is dedicated to guiding and, and supporting families in a really difficult time, and um, we want to do that at home if we can, and we also want to be very available to people. So we answer our phones all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, if if we're not answering it, we have an answering service that answers our calls for us, and we call back right away. We try very hard not to let people go for very much time. Um, because a lot of times it's an emergent condition that we're dealing with. So, you know, these are the common questions that, that we hear from people. You know, how do I know it's time? They'll say, you know, I just want him to go to sleep. Is he going to go to sleep and, and not wake up because that's what I really want? Sometimes people will say, I feel like I'm playing God. You know, they have a hard time making that decision because of that reason. Um, they feel like they're being selfish and they're just keeping the pet for themselves, but at the same time, they don't want them to get to the point where they're miserable either. And I always tell people, that's the hard part. You know, no one is going to be able to tell you that when that fine line is. So we just do the best that we can. So, um, as I mentioned, the decision to euthanize is, is very multifactorial. And again, very different for every family, every situation. And, um, you know, one thing I think that people who haven't had an experience with losing a pet or knowing someone who's lost a pet is that they, they sometimes have in their mind what they're going to see. You know, they're going to see over pain, they're going to see their pet you know, vocalizing, they're going to see very obvious signs um, that they're going to have you know, vomiting, diarrhea, they're not going to be eating, and they're waiting for, for all of these signs to happen. And a lot of times that's not going to happen, and certainly not everything. Um, so, you know, we really try to guide people through that and, and making a decision of, you know, what you're seeing, what's important, what, you know, what is okay, what might be treatable, or something where you can alleviate your pet's discomfort. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, um, you know, I think there's a lot of guilt involved sometimes because people have been told that you know, there's this we can do, we can do this test, we can do this treatment, you know, and they elect for various reasons not to do that. You know, the pet is 15 years old, dog, you know, has other concurrent issues, they don't have very much money, or they've already spent a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, I always try to impress on people that, you know, certainly it's important to do what you can, but just because there are things to do doesn't mean that you have to do. And that was a hard lesson for myself to learn early on because, you know, as a vet, you're trained, this is what you do, this is how you find out what it is, you do this test and this test, and this is how you treat it. And truly, never in veterinary medicine, in my schooling, do I remember someone saying, this is, you know, when you say enough is enough, you know, so that's what I really had to learn. And so, you know, most of us don't do that, go through that very often, so when you get to that point, that's why it's very confusing and difficult process is very emotional. There's a lot of factors that go into why that's such a difficult decision. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, sometimes people are calling us and saying, you know, we're here, he's ready, you know, I know it's time. And by asking a few questions, we find out, well, he's not on pain medication, so maybe that is something that can help him, you know, at least get through a little bit more time. Um, you know, so call your vet if you have if you have a good relationship with your vet and you know, on pain medications potentially that can help them. I and mean, that's just one of many examples. But you know, it's for us it's um, it's a difficult line to walk sometimes because we don't want to be judgmental, not having seen the pet because we're we generally never seen the pet before people calling us out of the blue. We don't have a relationship with them. Um, and we don't want to appear judgmental, but sometimes it's fairly obvious that there may be some things that they can do. But it's the taking the pet to the clinic that's the stopping point for a lot of people. In our situation, they're calling us because they want someone to come to their home. And they're feeling like, you know, I've done this, I've you know, spent the money, I've done everything my vet told me, or I've done everything I think I should do, and I just feel that this is the right decision. And ultimately, sometimes that's what it comes down to. Um, when I first started this service, people would say sometimes, well, I've been told you'll know when it's time. And I always thought that was kind of a weird thing to say, but honestly, the more I'm into this, the more I do feel there is a lot to be said about that. 
um, because you know the family is are the people that um, are around the pet 24 hours a day, or 24 hours a day. But they're around them the most. They know them. They've known them since puppyhood, or kittenhood, sometimes, or maybe they've only known them for four years. But they know the signs. They know the symptoms. They know what's normal for that pet. And so sometimes it is something where it's just intangible. You just have a feeling. You know, it's not something that your vet is going to recognize. It's not something that anyone else is going to recognize. It may not even be something that someone in your family is going to recognize. And you know, it's okay to trust your intuition too. Um, so again, this is just kind of it in a nutshell. The important considerations are obviously the comfort and the quality of life of the pet is the first and foremost. Um, but also, you have to consider other things like finances and your family. And I think too often people ignore that. Um, you know, and, and sometimes the last thing that people say to me, you know, well, I feel really bad about this, but you know, I've got this going on and this going on, and I just can't deal with this anymore. And you know, that's that's okay too. That is valid. And I, I think that people need to give themselves the credit sometimes. Um, so I think a lot of times people think they're being selfish. You know, that's going to affect your life. It's going to affect your ability to care for that pet. And, um, you know, I think sometimes people will admit that, you know, they feel like their relationship with their pet is not very good anymore because they've been forcing pills down, you know, their pet's throat. Their pet doesn't like them or, you know, it runs away when they see them. And they don't want that to be their last, you know, memory. So, um, People that you know should weigh in on this decision, you know, the ones that you should rely on the most, of course, are your veterinarian who knows your pet the best and knows their history, and they're going to be able to give you the medical expertise and know, you know have the experience to tell you what you may be able to expect given you know the diagnosis or presumptive diagnosis. Um, a veterinary specialist, um, same thing, may be able to give you even more in-depth you know experience as far as their um, experience with a particular disease. Um, hospice and palliative care, if you're able to find someone who can help provide that for you. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of that here in the Portland area right now. Um, there's a group of us that have kind of talked a bit about it. It's a whole new beast, or a whole other beast, I should say. Um, and ideally, somewhere along the line, you know, hopefully we'll get something like that going. But there are very good local veterinarians, like Louise Mesham and her group, um, who can provide very good um, home care as well, palliative and hospice care. We do not provide that. We only do home euthanasia, but um, I highly recommend Louise. Um, and then, of course, the family. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people are wanting the veterinarians to tell them, you know, when it's time. And and some people I find will follow that almost blindly. I and mean, I have people who call us and want to do the euthanasia because they've been told by the veterinarian that their pet basically has maybe a week left. And, you know, it's not my place to question that necessarily, but um, I, I think those are situations where people just really, you know, want someone to tell them what to do as opposed to they're really looking intuitively at their pet and what's going on and, you know, when it truly might be the right time for their pet. Um, and then I also wanted to mention children. I mean, this is a little bit going off on a tangent, um, but I think it's important also to include children in that decision, depending on, of course, their age, their emotional level, um, their relationship with the pet. Um, because I think, you know, at the very least, children should be told what is happening. They should be given a chance to say goodbye to the pet um, if they want to. They should be given a chance to be there. Um, during euthanasia if they want to, but, you know, children should, I think children are, on the whole, you know, very much like adults, and sometimes adults want to be present, and sometimes they don't, and that's okay. And the important thing is, is to ask them, you know, what they feel is right for them. So, um, I just wanted to kind of go over a few things you might see with older pets, and, and maybe, you know, a lot of you have seen these things, but just to kind of give you some idea of the things you'll see. And not that all of these things necessarily mean that your pet is at the end of their life, but you know, things that, that are, you should pay attention to and maybe begin to talk to your veterinarian about these, um, these things should you see them. Um, some pets will become increasingly um, you know, talkative, like if you have a, a 
kitty. A lot of times we'll see that more with cats. So people will say, well, he's really been very talkative lately, or he just he meows a lot. Um, they may become increase, um, increasingly sensitive to sounds. Um, and sometimes I think this is just, it, it may be a cognitive decline or maybe a decrease in their senses. You know, this may be the, vo the increased vocalization as well. They can't hear as well, and so, you know, they're, they, they're louder because they can now hear themselves and they, you know, project more. Um, a decreased sociability with the family, with other pets. Um, sometimes they might seem confused, disoriented, um, and changes in behavior like becoming more irritable, you know, maybe um, more anxious, um, increased aggression sometimes. I mean, I don't hear about that as much, but it can certainly happen. Any of these things can happen. And by protective behavior, I mean maybe protecting an area that's painful, like if they have, you know, painful hips, they may not want you to be in the back, petting you back there, or some people will say that, you know, when you cut them along the spine, they kind of yelp, or they might nip at you. Um, house soiling is very common with older pets, cats and dogs. Um, a lot of times the dogs are becoming incontinent. Um, kitties or, or you know, immobile, they don't have as much ability to get outside. Um, cats, you know, maybe they're just less fastidious. They're not getting into the box, they can't climb into it. Um, a lot of different reasons. And um, sometimes we, they um, become less um, hygienic. They may not groom themselves as well. You start to notice an unkempt appearance, or you see maps on your kitty, for example. Um, second corners goes back to the cognitive part. Where I have a lot of people tell me, oh yeah, I can all find him, and he's you know, stuck in this corner, and I have to turn him around. Um, repetitive behavior. I don't see that as much, but um, it is certainly something that you can see. And then changes in sleep cycle, particularly at night. Like I have a lot of people, particularly at the end of life, where the pet is um, a lot more anxious at night, or more, maybe more vocal, or maybe more painful, maybe clearly more painful at night. Um, so, on the subject of pain, um, you know, I, I think that. Again, a lot of people are expecting vocalization, very overt, obvious signs. I mean, a lot of you, if you have experience with pets and maybe recognizing some of those signs, um, these are some of the things that we're taught in, in veterinary medicine to look for. Um, increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate. Um, and I think it's important when you start to think about the pet and, and watching those things to maybe even get a baseline. Watch your pet. Um, you know, the way to quantify um, a baseline heart rate and respiratory rate is to look at them and count the respirations or their heart rate, if you can, um, within 10 seconds. How many um, breaths you, hear, you see or how many um, uh, heartbeats you see during 10 seconds, and you multiply that by six, and that will give you the number of um, beats per minute and respirations per minute. And that way. You know, when you get down the line, you kind of have an idea of what was more normal for, for your pet. Um, other signs of pain are restlessness, um, hiding. You know, sometimes they hide because they are just not feeling well, they don't want to be social, um, or, they're, you know, or they're actually painful. Um, decreased appetite or anorexia is one of the first things, of course, pet owners we notice. And um, that's a impor very important sign, and of course, I think most of us would take our uh, pets in at the work best um, and try to find out why, why that is. Um, again, vocalizing, it's, it's fairly uncommon in my experience that when pets are in pain, they'll actually vocalize, because I think it goes really against their nature to a certain degree, because if they vocalize, you know, the fox is going to come over and, and you know, grab them. They're indicating their vulnerability, so they're less likely to vocalize, I think. Um, and so certainly if you do hear vocalization, it's very important to um, pay attention to that. Changes in behavior, again, as I mentioned, and aggression. You know, some pets just do become um, very crotchety as they become more painful. But I also want you to realize that pain and suffering don't necessarily mean overtly broken leg pain, and I think a lot of people are expecting that. Um, you know, pain and suffering and, and discomfort fall under a number of different categories, and 
you know, you can have nausea, which is very hard to appreciate, I think, especially for the layman, and maybe really subtle. You know, maybe the, they're just not eating as well, or they're not drinking. Um, or it may be that they're, you know, salivating a little bit, and I think a lot of people don't really recognize that that is oftentimes a sign of nausea. Um, so, <clears throat> I always like to tell people when they're explaining symptoms that, that indicate to me that their pet is nauseous, and that, that's really important. And even though they're not showing over, you know, pain, I think nausea can be just as bad. I mean, I know I hate doing nauseous. I think that's the most horrible thing. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're nauseated, you can't do anything. You feel weak. You can't eat. You can't enjoy your food. And it's important that nausea is... Um, a very, very important thing to pay attention to. And then dyspnea. Um, this is one thing I find that people underestimate quite a bit. They have a pet that's, you know, breathing really hard or panting a lot, you know, and that can be an indicator of a lot of different things. But if you have a cat that's breathing with its mouth open, that is a really bad sign. And that's an emergency as far as I'm concerned. Um, but a lot of people don't recognize that and realize that you know, when you can't breathe, it is one of the most distressing things ever. You know, I think it's just like making this decision, making the end of life decision. Until you're in it yourself, it's hard to really put yourself there. And, and most pet owners try to do that. Most pet owners try to understand what their pet is feeling, but it, it is hard. But it is very important if you have a pet that's having trouble breathing, that that is um, very important to pay attention to. I think this, um, kind of sums up what I'm trying to say, and not just about pain and suffering, but you know what I'm going to go into as far as quality of life, and that suffering is anything that denies us our true self. And I wanted to show you this picture. I put this here because um, it kind of brings a tear to my eye when I look at it. And this was one of our clients, um, or one of our patients that we had. His name was Toby. And honestly, I don't remember all of the details of Toby, but um, it always just really struck me that, you know, this beautiful picture of Toby when he was in his prime, and then as he got older. Because to me, sorry, to me that picture, you know, is a dog that's in pain. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, he had a very nice ending. His parents had a huge RV, and we did things that they did RV. And he was a, he was the sweetest dog. Um, but uh, yeah, he had a very nice long life. 